Yo, yo, giggity, yo, what is good? And welcome back to Philosophy Digestion. I am your host, John Gavin. I hope that you have had an amazing summer because I know that I have, you know, sitting out enjoying the heating climate is always uh, relaxing and a little bit anxiety inducing if you really think about it. What did you do this summer? Uh, let me know because it feels weird to talk about my summer and then not hear anything in return. I have gotten some feedback and I, uh, think that I'm supposed to be doing a little bit more chit chat at the top or bottom of each episode that I do. And so this is going to go ahead and be me doing that. I, uh, Oh, my dog just walked away. He's not my dog. He's my roommate's dog. I have four roommates. They're pretty cool. Together, we make a house of a total of five. We split rent in a rent-controlled home in the middle of uh, downtown Portland, Oregon. And I used to be in a theater company. And there's this line that I had when I was a jester that we... Uh, bring up a lot I kind of as a joke in my house and we're not all like theater people we got business owners and veterinarians and artists and a national guardsman but the Shakespeare line that I had to say in a play once was what is the opinion of Pythagoras concerning wild fowl it's just sort of meant to be like if you have a PhD in math but you don't know anything about chicken then maybe don't talk about chicken or uh, if some dude is really knowledgeable about math, seems like a smart guy, doesn't mean you got to go and ask him about your wild fowl. And Pythagoras has a theorem. You may have heard of it. It's called the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I think that that's something that they're supposed to teach everybody in school. So it's not like a book you didn't read. I do think you're supposed to know that one. If you don't know A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, it will. I've never used it in real life. So uh, there's that little tidbit of wisdom for the day. But considering this guy Pythagoras is, uh, you know, still being talked about, I figured, you know, we should do an episode on Pythagoras. And as it goes, you know, especially before our modern era of dog watching journalism and mass produced content, people who were super like hyped on their great idea with unchecked power really can take it out of hand with and you know what else every single one not every single one but uh the history of western philosophy is just littered with pedophiles it's disgusting and the story of pythagoras is the story that i feel like we're still telling today of these crazy cult leaders who decide that they can have multiple wives going bananas in this leadership like voice of god role that they put themselves in but sometimes we just remember them for their theorems anyway yeah so this is gonna be the story of pythagoras the man who knows nothing about wild fowl or virtuous living here we go so around 700 uh, bc which is like 2,700 years ago, there was this, the first philosopher ever, his name was Thales, and we're not talking about Thales today, I'm just bringing him up because Pythagoras existed, like, right after him, made the first argument that, like, the entire world was made of something consistent, and so the way that we understand the world from looking at it can also be consistent. It's one of the foundational feelings and principles in scientific thought, which is kind of where we're at today. And so there is this relationship between philosophy and science in so far as that what we think comes from what we see and experience. And Pythagoras took it like a whole step further than that. And it's he says that the things that we see in the real world may teach us like facts, but more importantly, they teach us numbers, mathematics, Pythagoras and his followers. So this dude has followers described 
you know, the cosmos, the human face, everything that they saw in ratios and they believed in sacred geometry and that some of these ratios and shapes and numbers held very important, sometimes mystical value. Pythagoras, uh, we know him today as a philosopher and a mathematician, but people knew him as, you know, a prophet and a seer. But they should know him as a cult leader and a pedophile, which I know what you're thinking. This is the second episode we've done on a well-known philosopher who is a creepy, power-hungry pedophile. And philosophy really is a who's who of evil in power. Like I said, it's the second episode that we've got on creeps who are famous. So without further poo-poo, let's get into it. Actually, there'll be a little doo-doo. So this Pythagoras was uh, born in 570 BC around uh, Samos off the coast of Turkey. He was an eclectic, holier-than-thou number guy nerd who was uh, an incel. Pythagoras was like super religious and really superstitious. He believed that numbers, if they just appeared randomly in front of you, held deep meaning and could perhaps even help you understand what's going to happen. Like it's a message from the gods. He believed in reincarnation and that our souls would transmigrate through space and time, perhaps to the next world, perhaps to live in this one again. So we're off to a great start with logic and rational thinking with this guy Pythagoras. Definitely want to keep listening to his ideas. He had a bunch of followers and disciples that lived together in a collective commune. They, But we know that this guy Pythagoras had almost complete and unwavering control over his followers. These Pythagoreans, as they called themselves, literally naming their like group and their identity after their leader. They thought that his ideas were mystical or divine revelation, messages from God. They followed and worshipped him to the extent that some of the discoveries that Pythagoras claimed and that we remember him for may have actually come from the people in his community. He just, you know, slapped his brand on it and took it as his own. There are two sides to Pythagoras' uh, beliefs. There are the mystical and there are the logical or the scientific. And it seems uh, now that these two things wouldn't be able to coexist in someone's head. But this guy Pythagoras was definitely a loose cannon. So who knows what he's got rattling on around there. And for Pythagoras, the goal of life was freedom from the cycle of reincarnation, achieving that next plane and not just being sent back into another life on this planet. And you can achieve freedom from reincarnation by uh, following his strict behavioral uh, guidelines and his diet and by recognizing him as the messenger of God. What he took as messages from God are the facts of geometry and mathematics that these truths about our symbolic representation of numbers helped us see things that are true because they're self-evident. If you have 180 degrees and you draw a 90 degree line and you have one side that's 90 degrees, it just goes that the other half is also 90 degrees because it has to add up to 180. That is a logical mathematic and geometrical truth. Pythagoras and his followers believed that these had like divine meaning because the mathematical discoveries were like byproducts of, you know, just pure reasoning. Pythagoras believes that they are more valuable than our experiences and our observation. Pythagoras uncovering the underlying principle behind right angled triangles and that, you know, they're two shorter sides add up if you square them to the longest side squared every time the discovery that that is universally true a squared plus b squared equals c squared was so crazy to these people 
that it must have come from something like God and that it held such potential that maybe if they built a structure big enough that represented they, what they understood, that aliens would come down and, or God would see and know that we were making progress as humanity. And Pythagoras overall concludes that the whole cosmos must be governed by these mathematical rules or else there would be no order to it. And whereas before people had just assumed that the order to the cosmos was given by God, Pythagoras saw that there is a way we can divine and we can begin to see the order of the cosmos through numbers, the language of God, in his opinion. There's not a ton known about Pythagoras' life. He didn't write anything down himself, and unfortunately, it's been said that no one knows for certain what Pythagoras told his associates since they observed in their strict guidelines unusual silence. But modern scholars believe that Pythagoras was probably born on an island and that he probably traveled, he probably studied, and he probably visited Egypt because they used the 3-4-5 ratio in their building a lot. They know that at around age 40, he set up a community of around 300 people in Croton, southern Italy. This is his cult, where he was using his status as a thinker and a philosopher to brainwash, you know, women, children, men too, into believing that his ways and what he thought was the best way to live was the only way to reach, you know, salvation, that religious belief that we've been saved and that we're doing what God actually wants. He used that to get people to learn about math. And despite the fact that it was, we call it a commune and that it was kind of supposed to have a collective nature like these things all do, Pythagoras was clearly the community's leader. At the age of 60, he married a child, a little girl, Theano of Crotana. Even back then, people didn't like pedophiles. So this community started to grow really hostile toward Pythagoras and the people in Crotana did not like the Pythagorean cult and eventually forced them all to leave Croton where Pythagoras and the followers that would stay with him eventually fled to a place called Metapontum which is also in southern Italy and then he died there hopefully feeling rejected and like a loser then uh you know so it goes when the the head of a snake gets cut off and that snake is just a cult. A lot of times the community can disband and it was pretty much gone by the end of the fourth century, which is the 300s. So we don't really like this Pythagoras guy. And it's a super bummer that he's the one whose name we use and who we give all the credit for these ideas when some of them probably came from and were definitely written down by people who followed him later. The brighter minds that he was, however, able to um, convince to go on weird diets and not to talk. But one of the most important and interesting ideas that we attribute to Pythagoras, even though he's probably not the first and he won the last, was the idea of relationships between numbers and ratio proportions in real life. All of his theories were reinforced by investigations into music, and in particular, the relationship between the notes that like sound really good together. Supposedly, Pythagoras was listening to blacksmiths uh, ding on their uh, swords, and he noticed that there were some dings that sounded good next to each other, and there were some dings that uh, didn't sound so good when they dinged at the same time. And he began to notice eight note intervals depending on the size of the anvil and the size of the hammer and what he discovered was or what someone discovered probably a blacksmith was that the intervals were harmonious because the relationship between them was as precise as a mathematical ratio and a lot of the principles and ideas that pythagoreans began to develop about geometry, sacred geometry, the magic of necessary truths in space, also applied to necessary truths in sound 
and in music. And, you know, music is the fruit of love, and so we play on. Perhaps that playing can be measured in intervals and can be understood logically, these Pythagoreans think. To them, these beliefs even extend as high to the stars and that the angles of the planets when we're born and throughout our lives have deep influence on the lives that we lead. And every second we spend underneath the galaxy and within the galaxy is unique to us, our position, and so on and so forth. And we share the sky while we all live together. They say that number is the ruler of forms. They think that acoustics and emotion are an exact science and that it is numbers that govern our behavior. The numbers of our birth, the numbers of the stars, the numbers of the music around us. So when Pythagoreans started to apply their ideas to the entire cosmos, they were said to see and understand the harmonious relationships between the stars, the planets, the elements. And to an extent, this could just be them beginning to see patterns in stars' movement in the sky, perhaps making steps towards believing that the Earth is not flat. And in fact, it was Pythagoras and, uh, or more likely his followers, ideas that were taken up by the Renaissance astronomers that did discover that the Earth was not flat and that really charted the sky for things like navigation and, you know, living in this world. So the Pythagoreans had the right idea, but they just missed the, missed the arrow by, uh, missed the bullseye by a little arrow or something weird like that. And it wasn't even until 1865 that a chemist named John Newlands discovered that even the chemical elements, if you arrange them uh, by atomic weight, the ones with the most similar properties occur every eighth element, just like notes. Just like how every eighth note is, an o- you know, it's an octave. It's the same note, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And something that uh, all the astral projectors out there would also agree with is Pythagorean's uh, very important idea that abstract thinking is actually better than our senses and living in this world. It's uh, something that Plato takes up in his theory of forms, and it's something that rationalists even begin to start to argue again in the 17th century, because rationalists think that While it's important to be rational about what you perceive, you also can't perceive anything that's absolutely true. And the the Pythagoreans tried to combine rational thinking with their religious ideas to grapple with the problems that we all grapple with. You know, how do we know what is consistent in the universe? What are messages from God? How do we see them? Are there ever messages from God? If there were, what would they sound like? Almost everything that we know about Pythagoras and about God comes from those around us, things that we learn from others. And even though a lot of these things may have been one person's best conjecture, it can still help lead us on the right path. It can also help lead us astray, but oftentimes getting lost isn't actually about getting lost. It's discovering that that's not the right road to walk down. And uh, knowing which roads not to walk down is part of knowing the way. The Pythagoreans' ideas of ratios influenced a lot of classic architecture. And their ideas of beauty and the gold standard are something that people are still like obsessed with today. And that we still don't exactly know why these numbers consistently describe patterns in nature. The Pythagorean Brotherhood was not unlike the other cults of today, writes uh, Medium.com. The people who Pythagoras picked were chosen, participated in an initiation. They had purification and needed to abide by very strict dietary and behavioral rules, or else they would be kicked out of the 
group. So if you weren't meeting these standards, you were not allowed to be a part of the Pythagorean, uh, you know, uh, team, the Pythagorean cult. And there was always the looming threat of what your soul would transmigrate back to the earth as if you broke these rules or if you left the group with Pythagoras for some reason, your eternal life and your eternal soul may be damned or your next life, your next soul may be damned if you left this group. The only way to escape the cycle of life and suffering was through purification of the mind or so Pythagoras told his followers. And he told them that being a part of the cult was the only way to purify the body and the mind. And there are themes of, you know, prudence, uh, modest living, restraint, that are definitely things that we all could learn from. Bottom line is not everything this cult does is necessarily just crazy. You know, they, they had good math. Uh, they probably ate healthier than we do. But Pythagoras painted himself as the one who understood the order of the universe. The key to his understanding was uh, mathematics and a thought. I don't see leadership really uh, granting their people. It's something that they either, the leaders, the cult leaders, the persuaders, either they come up with it themselves or they think it's a great idea and so they slap their sticker of approval on it and brand it as their own. Some fun facts about uh, the Pythagorean cult. I hope that you're ready. Okay, so fact number one. Pythagoras murdered followers. Uh, some Maybe he drowned them. Maybe he buried them alive. Maybe he stabbed them and then buried them, but they were killed. Fact number two. The reason that they were vegetarian is because they believed that in reincarnation and that human souls were kept in animals. The philosopher and the mathematician banned his followers from consuming any animal meat, and they uh, also weren't allowed to eat beans. Uh, some say that Pythagoras thought that there were men's souls inside beans. Or some people say that Pythagoras thought that when you fart, it lets a little bit of your soul out. Uh, so, uh, belief number three. They believed that Pythagoras had godlike powers and a golden thigh. So they thought that Pythagoras had like supernatural abilities because he was good at math. They thought he could communicate with animals and remember his previous life as well as the animal's previous life, which is just like cult leader. These poor people probably had never heard of a cult before, but it's just such a red flag today. I feel bad. Supposedly, Pythagoras could predict earthquakes, though I don't see how. And he was credited with preventing hail from falling and preventing wind from blowing, as well as having the ability to calm the ocean. Supposedly, one of his thighs was made of gold. I d and I literally... Maybe he had, like, a really muscular thigh, and someone was being, like, artistic when they were writing about him, and then it got mistranslated, and humans are dumb, so they believe what they read. And unlike most cults of the time, the Pythagoreans actually really, they, they, they still had multiple wives that they married as uh, you know, children, uh, but women were active in Pythagoreanism. They were supposedly treated as mathematic equals, although they were a minority in the cult, and it's unclear uh, how much they participated. There isn't uh, direct writings or evidence that they were disrespected, so... It's sad that these women's pain were lost to time. Uh, one of the most famous women was Theano. She's uh, referenced uh, multiple times, sometimes as the wife of this guy, Brontinius, but also as the child wife of Pythagoras. And finally, uh, in addition to all these other weird rules, the Pythagoreans also were told to put their right shoe on for first, not to travel on public roads, and they were forbidden to touch white roosters and what is Pythagoras opinion of wild fowl they also had such a thing as the Pythagorean silence which is a part of their discipline and self-control requirement they said that it's supposed that people were meant to stay quiet for five years and 
they people marveled more at the silence of those who profess to be his pupils than those who have the greatest reputation for speaking because to them not speaking means that the noises we make with our mouth are just in this world the ideas that we have in our head are unique and only something god can know as they are one of the main pillars of beliefs that Pythagoras had was that, uh, you know, his followers shouldn't eat meat, which actually means that him and his followers were some of the earliest vegetarians. And they were also forbidden to eat bean. Like most cults, the Pythagoreans wore special garments and abstinence of the flesh was, according to classicalwisdom.com, insisted upon. However, we know that Pythagoras himself did not die a virgin. And like I said, Pythagoras is extremely superstitious, and he was mystical. And Pythagoras believed that certain things like shapes, colors, sizes, and numbers had divine meaning to our lives. The Pythagoreans conclude that the one thing that everything had in common was that it is numberable and can be counted including things like smell, taste, and sound. However, the idea of creating a hypothetical universe without numbers is impossible. They believe that numbers are the underlying substance that create everything. The OG, this is the idea underneath, we live in a simulation. And it's probably because for humans, all of our understanding of the universe are just ideas, are just experiences and things that we count on. But just because perception and logical numbers are how we perceive things doesn't necessarily mean that's how they exist in the real world. But the Pythagoreans say that limitations are set on the universe by numbers and that the relationship between things like the planets and sound dictate the way that we live our lives and the consequences of our actions like God. So the Pythagoreans really, really paid attention to the idea of harmony and unharmonious numbers. They think that harmony is when things opposites balance and when a, you know, good note is played and that when there's too much of something on one side or the other, that there will be imbalance and negative consequences will ensue. And some examples of opposites include red and green and masculine and feminine, right and left, rest and motion, darkness and light, good and evil, square and uh, circular. They even believed that since even numbers can be divided by two, and then by two again, un, you know, eventually a reaching one, that they represented the idea of unlimitedness. Just like uh, our genius friend John Green writes in The Fault in Our Stars, you know, they might only have limited time together, but every second can be divided into two into two half seconds, and every moment can be divided down and down and down into an infinite, which is really beautiful for two teenagers who love each other and who are dying. And in that unlimitedness, there can be balance. And if there's not a good amount of these things balanced in, you know, your room, your life, your personality, the stars you were born under, the Pythagoreans think that there's going to be some issues. The word that a lot of people use to describe the Pythagoreans is arbitrary. Now, the actual logical thinking of the Pythagoreans to reach these conclusions is lost and we often dismiss the conclusions that they come to because we don't understand how they got to them. And they were a mystical society after all, so there is a little bit of hocus pocus involved here, but you know what I believe about hocus pocus is that it can work like a placebo, a sugar pill. If I feel like shit and I take a sugar pill and it works, if I can't tell if it was real medicine or not, it doesn't matter. So they're a mystical group, for sure, that places a lot of value on mathematical relations. But they believed things like the number eight represents justice, 
while the number seven represents wisdom. It's the, while they believed in sacred geometry, they also believed in numerology, which are both, you know, very much esoteric. They're uh, more about how we feel things are because we feel things like justice and we feel things like wisdom, but justice and wisdom are very hard to prove outside of human experience with things like numbers. And so for them to say eight represents justice and seven represents wisdom, I haven't been able to find anything that backs up the reason that they have these beliefs about these numbers that makes any sense to me or that was actually written by Pythagoras or any of his followers. Were they a cult? Perhaps. They certainly had all of the uh, symptoms of being a cult, including a pedophile leader who marries a child. But a lot of them were killed or driven out of uh, Croatoa, Croatona. And the uh, original Pythagorean school, the Pythagorean cult, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> the town burned to the ground. And don't get me wrong. It's not like everybody hate, hated Pythagoras. If that was true, we wouldn't have still have his stuff today. He was invited to teach in places like Sicily. And there's a lot of uh, energy online where they talk about Pythagoras and his followers being great men. That sprang from the supreme knowledge of Pythagoras. And there are Pythagorean cults out there still today, teaching weird diets, the beauty of numbers, yada, yada, yada. There is a, a hint of things like pedophilia, white supremacy, and toxic masculinity not so hidden in these groups that are still following someone who lived in a time when having slaves was okay. So according to medium.com, there are 10 signs that you are in a cult. And I am going to be talking about uh, Pythagoras using those 10 signs. So the first sign is the leader has ultimate authority. And Pythagoras, as the you know speaker for God, the seer, you know it, what he said and what he believed was right to do day to day and big picture went. So I think we can check that box. He had ultimate authority, even though he preached abstinence and prudence yada 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 he drowned people who disagreed with him he married children he did whatever he wanted sign number two that you're in a cult is that the group suppresses skepticism and this group definitely suppressed skepticism like i said uh, you had to be indoctrinated initiated and go through rigorous, you know, compliance in order to be in this cult. And if you were skeptical about it or didn't adhere, you were out. Okay. Number three is delegitimizing former members. Uh, oh, I'm going to pull up the facts. According to legend, uh, this guy, Hippasus of Metapodum didn't want to follow the tradition or he deferred in some way. And instead of just letting him leave peacefully, they drowned him at sea. Before that happened, Pythagoras had uh, tombstones erected just to threaten him with death if he, uh, you know, kept disobeying and didn't adhere to their strict behavior. So I think that delegitimizing former members gets like two check marks. Uh, number four, they were paranoid about the outside world. And while I uh, couldn't find anything that said they were paranoid. I can tell you that around 480 BC, there was just general persecution of the Pythagoreans. A lot of them were killed or uh, driven out of Carotona. The place where they, you know, hung out their like commune area was burned to the ground. So if they weren't paranoid, they should have been. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and check box number four that they were paranoid about the outside world. Number five, shame cycles. I think that having a tombstone erected counts as shame, as does being told to keep silent. Uh, number six, the leaders above the law. He preached abstinence, was not abstinent. There you go. Number seven, a sign that you're in a cult, is thought reform methods. So I was like, a thought reform method? What is that? Well, a thought reform method is listed as fasting, chanting, meditation, hypnosis, prayer, etc. 
So definitely, I don't know if there was hypnosis, but probably chanting, definitely fasting and meditation. So I guess we're checking that box, even though I don't think any of those things necessarily sound culty. If it's on the list, it goes. Number eight. The group is elitist. They had tiers that you had to test and prove yourself into, creating an elitist hierarchy at which Pythagoras sat at the top. Number nine, no financial transparency. Well, I don't have any of their tax documents today, so that doesn't feel transparent to me. Next. Uh, Ten, secret rites and rituals. Yeah, their rites and rituals are lost to time, which keeps them the most secret that they could be. Well, we checked every box, and we even checked some twice. So I'm going to go ahead and say that Pythagoras fails the test and is definitely a manipulative cult leader who should have been stopped before. Well, you know what? They did get him. They kicked him out of town. They burned his place to the ground. I think that, you know, humanity has a way of getting rid of cults, and uh, that's all I got on that one. I think there's an, we have this uh, dream that old things are inherently valuable. And while they do teach us about the past, they teach us about those who lived under stars that we uh, don't have at the same angle. Our ability to reflect and our access to information today is so great that it's easy to see what is important. But our access to information allows us to see what is not true and was not and what is not important. And I think that it's time to let go of things that are arbitrary and just blindly listening to those who are right about ratios on, you know, virtues. Just because someone's good at architecture doesn't mean that they necessarily know what's right and wrong. Or as, uh, you know, my friend William Shakespeare likes to say, what is the opinion of Pythagoras concerning wildfowl? Thank you very much for tuning into this episode of Philosophy Digestion. I've been John Gavin, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Uh, please, or you know, what do they say? Rate, review, and subscribe to the show. Uh, we're going to have really fun ones coming out here every other week. And uh, go ahead and give me a follow on Instagram at John Gavin TLDR for updates on me and this exciting podcast. I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.